Welcome to worship with us here at Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. Pastor Di here. As you can tell, we continue to worship via Facebook. And we also have our drive-in worship on Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., where you can wave to each other from the comfort of your vehicle and still worship together. Council is still deliberating on the safety of returning to an in-person, in-the-sanctuary worship as the numbers of the COVID-19 virus continue to rise in our areas. So we continue to lift them up in prayer as they deliberate what is best to do. We keep in prayer this day all our church, community, state, national, and international leaders, our scientists, our medical staff, our essential staff, educators, students, shut-ins, especially during this time. We also ask that you keep in prayer Mary Rose and her kidney donor. They're both home recuperating, and we give thanks to God for that. We also want you to keep Ann Hoff and her family in prayer. Ann is back in the hospital and is having a tough time, so we pray for Ann and her family. A reminder, we will have our November community Thanksgiving dinner uh, be Tuesday, November 17th from 5 to about 6.15. It'll be the same as it has been the last two months. It'll be a pick up and go only. It'll be our regular Thanksgiving meal. We just won't be able to celebrate it together as in years past. All are welcome. Please tell your friends and neighbors. And please remember if you would like pastoral guidance, prayer, or phone call, or just want to call and say hey, you can contact me by email, Facebook, text, or an old-fashioned phone call, 402-320-0342. We're reminded in 1 John, the third chapter, the 18th verse, Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. We begin our worship together this day with a Veterans Day Remembrance. If you've ever been to a military funeral, you know that following the Christian burial rite is the military rite. And at the conclusion, taps is played. The American flag is that's draped over their coffin is carefully folded very meticulously into a triangle by the honor guard and then is presented to the next of kin. The officer in charge kneels quietly down before the spouse or parent or child or the closest family member and says these words. On behalf of the President of the United States and the people of a grateful nation, may I present this flag. It is presented as a token of appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. Those words, on behalf of a grateful nation, an honorable and faithful service, is what we do on Veterans Day. We come together as a grateful nation to give thanks for honorable and faithful service, Veterans Day. It's a day that's officially ushered in at 11 o'clock a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month. November 11. This is a day and this is a moment that the amethyst was first signed and signed ending the horror of World War I in France, 1918. November 11th was designated as the conclusion to a trench warfare. It cost lives of many soldiers and seamen and, and maimed so many more. Veterans Day, a day when we recognize and give thanks for the service and sacrifice of these men and women who have served in the armed forces. These men and women and their families have endured hardship, separation, and sometimes loss for the sake of keeping peace and fighting for justice around the world. Servicemen and women work to assist and build up communities and suffering populations around the world. Today, there are over 26 million veterans living among us who have answered our nation's call to military duty. We'll never be able to thank these people, these veterans, past or present, 
Yet we are the recipients, the beneficiaries of their willingness to defend and protect this land. We honor their commitment to duty and willingness to sacrifice of themselves. Psalm 127 reminds us, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. Even the strongest and bravest of human heroes stands in need of God's grace and the wisdom and guidance that we seek in prayer. Let us pray. There have always been wars, dear God, because there's always been problems between human beings. As long as there's been history, battle lines have been drawn and people have fought with one another. We pray we would have that kind of love and insight that would prevent war. We offer our prayers for all those who have volunteered or been drafted to fight their country's wars. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care in keeping all men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad in your loving care. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We continue with the sharing of the peace with one another. Abundant grace is God's gift to us. Out of all proportion to our wrongdoing, we receive grace and forgiveness from God's amazing love revealed to us in Christ Jesus. We then share this love so freely given to us with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. In our circle of uncertainty and hurry, God is our fixed point of calm. In our stretched moments of stress and emotion, God is the secure center of peace. In our well-worn routines of every day, God brings a fresh flash of inspiration. Come, let us worship God who meets us in the ordinary and brings us to the holy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of creation, we gather again for worship. In a world of petty dreams, we seek your great vision. In a world of empty conversations, we seek a living word. Be with us and speak to us. Spark our imaginations that we may depart an energized and faithful people. Amen. We often think God is out there somewhere distant and uncaring, but God hears our hearts. God shares our struggles. God walks with us as we try to be faithful disciples. Let us come to the one who is as close as the very breath we take in this moment to confess the brokenness of our lives. Please join me as we pray together our prayer of confession. We are so easily confused by what the world tells us, watching God, that we forget the stories of faith we heard as children. We are so fearful of tomorrow, we are not aware that your spirit is with us today. We are so busy wondering what if or suppose. We cannot hear the promises you whisper to us. So once again, gracious God, have mercy on us. You know our hearts so well, touch them with your grace. You see our deepest fears, heal them with your peace. You hear our secret longings, Speak to them of your hope. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We lift up our confessions and we are assured of God's pardon. The one who searches our broken hearts has found the way to mend them and to make us new people. The good news 
is that everything God has done for us has been done in Christ that we might be made whole. With kindness and with justice, God makes us new people. We will sing our thanks through all of eternity. Great is God and greatly to be praised. Amen. Let us take a moment to pray for for God's word to speak to us this very day. Jesus, giver of peace. I so easily get distracted when I'm trying to focus and hear your Holy Spirit. Help me quiet my mind in the middle of my busy life. Help me to pause and to make space to listen to the most important voice of all. Empower me to be a good listener to the gentle whispers of your spirit. Help me follow the example of Jesus who would slip away in the evening or the early morning to be alone with you. Teach us to abide in you. Amen. Please join in our reading of the psalm, which is 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and the Lord delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight path until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry, and he fills with good things. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and the Lord brought them to their desired haven. Let us thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Our Holy Gospel today is taken from St. Matthew, the 14th chapter, Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from land and the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got back into the boat, the wind ceased. 
and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of our Lord. Praise to you, O Jesus Christ. Will ever wonder how the Gospels came about? After Jesus' death, those that had believed in him and had seen his work became the eyewitnesses to the glory of God firsthand and therefore became the keepers of the story. However, as the years passed, the eyewitnesses were dying off one by one and the church grew afraid. Things were changing. What would happen to the church as they know it? Would these wonderful stories and parables and miracles and all the teachings of Jesus that they had gathered together to hear be lost? So somewhere between 75 and 80 AD, Mark sat down and wrote the first gospel. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, Christ, the Son of God. Well, this was followed then by Matthew and Luke somewhere between 80 and 90 AD. And John's gospel would be the last one written around 95 to 120 AD. Well, the central point of these four accounts was to answer one question. Who is this Jesus anyway? Well, the backdrop of our gospel is interesting. Three of the gospels leave us with this same account. They know something about hard times. Severe persecution breaks out in A.D. 44. Peter, the leader of the church, is imprisoned and barely escapes death. James is one of the circle and the inner circle of Jesus' three companions, and he's beheaded. Peter, crucified during Nero's reign. Jesus' brother James, one of the church leaders, is put to death, and in 64 A.D., Nero instigates a huge fire in Rome and blames the Christians, which starts a whole nother round of persecution. Jerusalem, their city of cities, is totally destroyed in AD 70. This is the world chaos in which our early church found itself. And so, under the cover of darkness, they would close the curtains in someone's house and quietly worship together on Sundays. And someone would say, Elder, tell us the story again about that night on the sea. Well, it was a story that spoke to their hearts and and lives and and the conditions they found themselves in. You see, they, they knew about stormy weather. They had lost leaders and family members and friends because of their faith. Others had simply renounced their faith. One had to live after all. And when Caesar passed an edict that he was God and that all must burn a pinch of incense on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord, many Christians just followed suit to save their lives. But this little cluster remained faithful. Caesar is not Lord, they say. Jesus is Lord, Jesus only. And so this story was told again and again. The elder continues. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 and for a second time, he tries to get away to find a quiet place to rest and to pray. So Jesus sends his disciples by boat across the lake, which was about five miles wide. This is the first time in Matthew's gospel that Jesus leaves the disciples alone. The leading elder continues with the story. It was night. Sometimes, he said, the dark swirling waters look so scary. And they murmur, yes. He continues, the disciples rowed that little boat or tried to with the wind against them. Somebody in the crowd Chuckle softly. <laughs> Seems like the wind is always against us, too. Yes, the elder says, we have had our share of trying to row our boat with strong wind blowing in our face. Yes, they reply, have we ever. And then the wind gets stronger and the waves choppier and those strong seasoned fishermen are terrified. 
utterly terrified. They know what storms can do. They've all lost brothers or friends or fathers on the water. It takes every ounce of strength they had to keep the boat from tipping over. The elder grows quiet and then continues. It was sometime in the fourth watch of the night, which was between three and six in the morning with the disciples in that small boat in the dark with waves crashing, knowing any minute could be their last. Helpless and afraid, they do not know what to do. And looking across the lake, they see a figure. It's a ghost, someone says. And you can now hear a murmur in that little house church. A chuckle, really. They already know how the story ends. It wasn't a ghost at all. As the figure gets closer, one of the disciples cries out, It's Jesus, guys. It's not a ghost. It's Jesus. And there on the water, with the wind blowing so hard they can hardly hear what he said, Jesus speaks to them. Take heart. Be not afraid. But the elder retelling the story is not finished. He continues with the dialogue that goes on between Simon Peter and the Lord. Simon, Jesus said, so glad to see you. And Peter said, Lord, may I come to you? Jesus nods and Simon Peter begins to walk on the water. As the elder continues, many listening are now leaning in, almost holding their breath, even though they know the story by heart. Telling the story faster now, with great emphasis, the elder continues, but Peter looks down. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and sinks like a rock. However, as he is drowning, Jesus reaches out and pulls Peter up. They both walk back to the boat and crawl in and the strangest thing happens, the elder says. The wind ceases and the water becomes calm and the disciples in awe and wonder say, truly, you are the son of God. Do you see why the early church loved that story and left it in the gospels? On a dark and stormy night, when they thought all was lost, at three o'clock in the morning, Jesus got into the boat with the disciples and the wind and the waves ceased peace. It was so peaceful. That's what the elder said. Somewhere I've read that the novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, in the real dark of night of the soul, it is always three o'clock in the morning. Well, the disciples had a real dark night experience. Have you ever had a three o'clock in the morning experience or that nightmare that you just can't shake? Something scary, something beyond your control, something that would just sweep you away? Well, maybe you find yourself feeling like those fishermen with arms aching from rowing against that wind and you're physically and emotionally and spiritually exhausted. Maybe you feel like all your resources are depleted and a, a depression or a fear surrounds you like a fog. What's your three o'clock in the morning? Money? Worried about the stock market? The food insecurity? Loss of employment? Being alone? Your health, the pandemic, the elections. When will we be able to worship like before the pandemic? Maybe you're worried about getting old and being a burden on your children. Or what if your money runs out? Or maybe you don't worry about yourself, but you worry about your kids, your little kids, your grown up kids, your grandkids. Maybe it's watching the six o'clock news and looking out on a world where the values seem so twisted. We could go on and on, but everybody, everybody has some three o'clock in the morning. 
You see, we too are in charted turbulent waters in the church, in our communities, in our nation, in the whole world right now. How do we continue to be the church during the pandemic? How do we continue being the nation in this divide that is happening? What will we do for Christmas if we can't gather like we always do and sing and have fellowship? It's three o'clock in the morning. However, we are not alone in that boat, in this turbulent waters. Someone is in that dark with us. And we just need to call out to our eternal Father, strong to save. Those little house churches in the first century would tell us this story over and over of these stormy seas and Peter and Jesus walking on the water. It was about a dark and stormy night when they realize they are not alone. So when we have that three o'clock in the morning, when the waves are choppy and our rowing is just too much and we feel like we're sinking, remember we are not alone. Over and over Jesus says, be not afraid. So you see, it's understandable that the early church in a hard time would gather together and tell this story for comfort and strength again and again. And we tell it now because it's also our story. Whatever three o'clock in the morning comes, the waves will come high and the water cold and the night dark. But Jesus comes and says, take heart, it is I be not afraid. Eternal Father, Strong to Save is a hymn that was written as a prayer for people traveling on the sea. And it was written in a time when ships were made of wood and sailors were made of iron. A time when sailing to distant ports meant risking your life. Eternal Father, Strong to Save is a hymn that's traditionally associated with seafarers particularly in the maritime armed services. The hymn became popular with the Royal Navy and United States Navy in the 19th century. William Whiting, 1825 to 1878, was an Anglican churchman and resided on the English coast near the ocean. It was at age 35 that he felt his life spared by God when a violent storm in the Mediterranean nearly claimed the ship he was on. Well, the storm instilled his belief in God's command over the rage and the calm of the sea. So when Whiting was a headmaster at Winchester College some years later, the memory of that voyage allowed him to provide comfort to one of the boys he taught. You see, one day a student confided in him that he was about to embark on a journey to America. It was a voyage that was fraught with danger at that time. So a very sympathetic Whiting described his own frightening experience and he and the other boys prayed for this terrified student. And then Whiting told him, before you depart, I will give you something to anchor your faith. So Whiting wrote a poem describing God's power over even the mighty oceans that poem, written in 1860, became the original text for the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. We are reminded through the Gospels, through the hymns we sing, that Jesus alone brings us out of our distresses and is with us in every storm, through every attack. In the fourth stanza, we find a prayer to our triune God who shields us in danger's hour. No matter what the danger, the Holy Spirit enables us to hold to the protecting truth against dangerous times, turbulent times. Jesus tells us, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, back to Peter, without faith, without focus on Jesus, he begins to sink. So he does the only thing he can think to do. He cries out to Jesus for help. 
and Jesus reaches out his hand and saves him. Eternal Father, strong to save, we too face dangers all around. They may be dangers like storms and earthquakes. They can be physical like pandemic and aging. They can be spiritual when our faith is attacked by doubts. Whatever the danger, we must remember Peter, whose faith was also struggling, and follow his example. Cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. So whether we are on land or sea or in the air, we are never beyond that gracious hand of our Lord. God hears us when we cry out and when we lift up our prayers. So remember, next time you're in that boat and the wind is howling and the waves are crashing, remember that next time of confusion and anxiety that just surrounds you. Remember that next time you find yourself so afraid of all the darkness around you. Remember that next time when you're uncertain of your very next steps, Jesus calls out to us with certainty, I am with you always, come to me. So today, we pray for all who are surrounded by a raging sea, who are caught in a storm, and need the assurance of God's protection. And today we pray for ourselves and ask Jesus to bring calm and peace to our world out of the distress and trouble it's in. And remember Psalm 71, verse 2, which says, Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Amen. Friends, together let us declare what we believe. In faith, we acknowledge that God has acted in the past in a holy history. In faith, we confess that God seeks to rule our lives today. In faith, we affirm that God continues to send prophets and speak through willing vessels to guide the course of all history toward its end. In faith, we imagine that end to be characterized by the traits we find in Jesus Christ compassion, justice, and love. In faith, we long to be part of that purpose. As people of God, we join in prayer for one another. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we praise you that in life and in death, you are our God eternal, strong to save. We thank you, God, for the gift of this day with all of its promise for joy, meaning, and purpose. We thank you that you stoop to comfort us in our distress and to soothe our aching hearts. Hear these laments that haunt our souls. We pray for our friends and family who suffer from disease or injury, for those in the hospital and those at home recovering. We often speak in painful words about relationships that have gone bad. We grieve the state of this world. Regions ravaged by violence, poverty, political corruption, natural disasters, and the pandemic. And so we seek your peace and healing and wholeness. As we are saddened by the failure of leaders and citizens to step up and enact those things that make for peace and wellness in this world. And we admit our own actions or inactions in all of these evils that plague this world. And we give you thanks for the gift of life and the joy of new life. We thank you for babies and children, for students and educators. We thank you for loving and faithful parents. We thank you for the gift of maturity and growing in grace. And Lord, give strength to those bearing heavy burdens to those who deal with addictions, mental illness, loneliness, loss of homes or jobs or loved ones. Through all the ages, you have shown your faithfulness to all generations. 
Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit today in the week to come and through all of eternity that we may celebrate your grace so freely given. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we lift this all to you as we pray the words of our hearts, spoken and unspoken, in the name of your Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right, our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. You made us in your image so we might be your people and worship you forever. But blinded by the seductions of the world, we wandered far from your kingdom, putting our trust in those powers that cannot save us. Despite our turning our backs on you, you have clung to us in grace and love, determined to be faithful to the covenant you established with us. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the servants around heaven's throne and with all the faithful of every time and every place who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup. We break the bread and you bless the cup so that we are in communion with the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in Jesus' name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, we are sent out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O God, to conform our lives to your kingdom of love, justice, and peace. Help us to live as the Lord requires to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you, our God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and friend, praying the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, Christ is the bread of life. We have nourished ourselves many times on God's word, yet we're hungry again. Friends, God prepares a feast for you and all people, a feast of good things, a feast of peace. Come and taste, eat and be filled, drink deep and never thirst again. I declare to you all are welcome at this table. Thanks be to God, all are welcome. As Jesus gathered around table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup after he'd given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me, the blood of Christ shed for you.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and give you his peace. Amen. Jesus calls us to step out in faith, to follow where he leads, even if what he calls us to do seems impossible. So let's go from here with courage, trusting in God's presence and power and eager to do God's will. Amen. <music>